Okay, the, the next talk is a, an actual gerontologist, somebody who works clinically with uh, aging people. Uh, John Sorkin, who's from the University of Maryland School of Medicine Division of Gerontology, uh, is going to speak about medical epistemology, a gerontologist perspective. I think we need a... So, as a gerontologist, I can tell you the bad news, and the bad news is, if you want to live a long time, and if you want to have good cognition for a long time, there's one thing to do. Pick your parents carefully. <laughs> that is the single most important factor in having a long life. It also helps if you duck when a bullet flies over your head, if you're a young man, and if you don't jump out of airplanes. Excuse me? So I'm going to speak to you about medical epistemology, a gerontologist's perspective. Just, I just plugged it in and it worked. Okay. There we go. All right. I have an impossibly long presentation because I did not know that I was for sure that I was going to speak today, and I didn't know how long I had, and it's so long that I hope you'll invite me back to finish it. All right. <laughs> All right, so how do we gain knowledge? The gold standard is the randomized clinical trial. However, it can't always be used. For example, it can't be used if you want to study things that are ethically impossible to study. You can't randomize people to smoke and not smoke. So the goal of this presentation is to ask how we gain knowledge when a randomized trial cannot be used. I'd like to go over five different kinds of trials, cross-sectional, time, uh, time series, longitudinal, case control, and cohort, and to describe problems and limitations associated with these five designs, all of which can be used when you cannot do a clinical trial. Let me start off with the cross-sectional design. Here you see a figure, and you're going to see this figure a lot. On the x-axis, you see age. Uh, excuse me, time, here given in months. In the y-axis, you have age in age decade. The way you do this type of study is you gather a group of people of a given age between 20 and 29 over a short period of time, here shown in January, at the mean value of some parameter y and a measure of its variation, here shown as a standard error. At the same time, gather another group of people age 30 to 39, get their mean and their standard error. Do the same thing for people who are 40 to 49, 50 to 59, 60 to 69. You have done that study. You can say that cross-sectionally, the mean value of Y in 20 to 29-year-olds is Y1. In 60 to 16-year-olds, it is Y5. If you are brave, you can regress Y on age, and you can get a cross-sectional slope. All right. There are a number of sources of bias for, for, from a cross-sectional study. Let's assume we're doing a cross-sectional study of height that finds that height decreases with age. There are a number of possible etiologies of this. First, there may be loss of height due to shrinkage of the intervertebral discs and loss of spinal bone min mineral density with fractures of your back, which will make you look shorter, or a birth cohort effect. What is a birth cohort effect? It's a variation in the health that arise from different factors to which each birth cohort is exposed as environment and society changes. For example, nutrition in utero and childhood can affect height. As nutrition gets better, cohorts born more recently are taller than previous cohorts. I like to explain things in figures rather than words, so let me use this figure. On the x-axis, I've got date of birth. On the y-axis, some parameter of y of interest. And on the other y-axis, age at examination. And what we're going to see is people born in 1910 are born with a value of 10. They retain that value throughout their life. When they're examined in the year 2000, they are age 90. People who are born in 1920, they're fortunate. Food was a little bit more common. At birth, they had a value of 20. They maintained it throughout their life. When they were examined in the year 2000, they were age 80. People born in 1980, they can go to McDonald's and get whatever they want. They can even get falafel. 
They are born with a value of 80. They maintain that throughout their life. When they're examined in the year 2000, they have a value of 20. If you look at these data, you will say 20-year-olds have a value of 80, 30-year-olds have a value of 70, 40-year-olds have a value of 60, 90-year-olds have a value of 10, and you're going to say that Y decreases with age. It does not. It is simply a birth cohort effect. Another problem with cross-sectional studies is selective mortality. Here we have age on the x-axis and on, y some parameter of in on the y-axis some parameter of interest. If at the age of 20 you have a value of 130, uh, you live to be 30, you eat your birthday cake, and boom, you die. Very unfortunate. If at the age of 20 you are born with a value of 120, ah, you get to eat more birthday cake. But come the age of 40, you have your birthday cake, and boom, you die. If at the age of 20 you have a value of 70, you live a long lifespan and you have lots of birthday cake. Okay, so what's going to happen? In people who are 20 to 29 year olds, you've got the whole span of values. In people who are 30 to 39 year olds, you've lost the, old, the highest values. 40 to 49, the two highest values, and so on. So when you get to age 80 to 89, you only have one set of values. So what are you going to say if you look at the study? You're going to say, why is decreasing with age? It is not. It's constant in everyone, but the higher your value, the earlier at age at which you die, so it looks as if there is an aging effect. There is not. Let's move on to the time series design. Here I have uh, time here in years and age, again in age decades. You do a time series study by in 1990, you recruit people who are age 40 to 49, you get some parameter, get the mean, Y1, and a measure of its variability, S1. In the year 2000, you get another set of people who are 40 to 49. They can't be this set because these folks are too old. You measure the parameter, get the mean, Y2, and its standard error. In the year 2010, get a third group. Now you've done your time series study. You know that in the year 1990, the mean value was Y1, 2000 Y2, 2010 Y3. You can regress Y on age and get a time series value for the slope. What are the possible biases in a time series analysis? The first is very simple. It's selection bias. Let's say in the year 1980 you do a study of midgets, and in the year 2000 you do a study of giants. You're going to get different values. You're going to say Y has changed, but it hasn't. The only problem is you're studying very different groups. And you're going to tell me there are no giants in this world? Just look at National uh, Basketball Association players. They're all giants. Another potential problem is methodological, methodological change. Consider a uh, study of serum cholesterol. You use one instrument in 1980, another one in the year 2000. They get slightly different values. You're going to say things have changed from 1980 to 2000. They haven't. It's just because you're now using Whizbang 2000 instead of old paint. All right, another design. Longitudinal design. Here again we have time in years in the Y age decade. In 1990, get some people who are aged 20 to 29 get the mean value of whatever characteristic you're interested in, have the people come back 10 years later in the year 2000. They are no longer 20 to 29, they're now 30 to 39. Get the mean value in that group. Be very nice to them, ask them to come back in the year 2010. Now they're 40 to 49. And now they have a new mean, Y3. You have now done a longitudinal study. You say that in the year 1900, and 90, the mean was value was Y1, 2000, Y2, 2010, Y3. If you are really brave, you can regress Y on age and come up with a slope. What are potential sources of bias in a longitudinal study? The first is a secular trend. Let's say you have a longitudinal study that finds a fall in serum cholesterol with aging. Several etiologies are possible. There may be true change in metabolism with aging or a secular trend. A secular trend is a change occurring over a long time, usually years or decades, that is the result of environmental influences rather than primary biological aging. For example, a society accepts that high cholesterol leads to heart disease, people eat less fat, and cholesterol concentration drops. 
But if that happens in the middle of your longitudinal study, you're going to say that cholesterol drops with aging. It doesn't. Well, it really does. But that's another presentation. Another source of bias, change in instrument. You are doing a study. The first seven years, you use one instrument, old paint. And then you get a new NIH grant, and you buy WhizBang 2000. WhizBang 2000 is great. Not only is it shiny and make you a cup of double mocha cappuccino in the morning before it gives you the cholesterol values, it reads cholesterol a little bit higher. If that happens to you and you put these data into a regression, you're going to get you're going to get trouble. There's the first seven years, you get one set of values. The last three values, when you change your instrument, you get different values. You're going to say that Y is going up with age, but it's not. It's just because old paint is dead. All right. Case control and cohort designs. Cross-sectional time series and longitudinal studies that I've gone over very quickly are used to study a continuous variable that can take on a large range of values. For example, serum cholesterol, IQ, or height. <clears throat> if you want to study a variable that can take only a few states, two in particular, dead versus alive, disease versus not disease, yes or no, other techniques are needed, specifically the case control study and the cohort study. Let's describe the case control study quickly. You gather a group of people. You ask, does the subject have the disease you're interested in? If the answer is yes, you call them a case. If the answer is no, you call them a control. Then you ask, was the subject exposed to the risk factor of interest? If the answer is yes, you call them exposed. And if it's no, you call them not exposed. And then you make something which is almost as dear to me as my wife, a two by two table, which has columns, disease, the diagnosis having disease at entry, yes versus no. History of exposure, yes versus no. There were eight people who were diagnosed as having disease at entry and the history of exposure. The people who were not, have no history of exposure and were not exposed and so on. You can then use the numbers in this two by two table to do some calculations, which I'll show you about. The essential characteristic of a case control st uh, study is that data about disease status and exposure status are obtained at the same time at entry to the study. The measure of association in a case control study is the odds ratio. It's the odds of exposure given disease status, which I hate. It's a little bit easier to look at it this way. It's the odds of exposure in subjects with the disease divided by the odds of exposure in subjects without the disease. And you're going to say to me, John, what the heck is the odds? The odds is the probability of an event occurring divided by 1 minus the probability of an event occurring, which is the probability of an event occurring divided by the probability of it's not occurring. If you've ever gone to the track and bet on the horses, you know about odds. We can go into them in more detail some other time. In any event, you take the data that you've gotten from your case control study, you make a two by two a table, you make me think of my wife, who I love more than a two by two table. Eight people were diagnosed of having disease at entry and exposure and so on. The odds of uh, exposure given disease is A over C. The odds of uh, non-exposure given disease is B over D, and you calculate the odds ratio. All right. So the, don't do that to me, computer. The uh, measure of association is the odds ratio. If the odds ratio is greater than what? You're trying to tell me that I'm supposed to go away, computer? If the odds ratio is greater than one, stay. Exposure is associated with disease. If the odds ratio is less than one, exposure is associated with protection from disease. If the odds ratio equals one, exposure is unassociated with disease. Now, there's a very nice feature about the odds ratio, which I originally showed you is A over C divided by B over D. It equals A over B divided C over D, which is very, very useful for people like me because it means that the odds of exposure giving disease status, which you're not really interested in, is equal to the odds of disease given exposure. You want to know, is it more likely that I'm going to get disease if I'm exposed than if I'm not exposed? That's the equation that we care about, not this. But it turns out that a case control study gives you this, which equals that. All right. 
So although we gather data within disease groups in a case controlled study and compute the odds ratio of exposure by disease group, the ratio we compute is equal to the odds of disease by exposure. That is A over C, BD equals this. All right. So what are the potential biases from a case control study? The first is recall bias. Subjects with disease search their memory for a history of exposure. What is the solution? Determine exposure status from records or objective tests, for example, blood tests. Another problem is assignment bias. Knowledge of disease status may affect search for the exposure. If a subject is known to have disease, the searcher may probe more deeply to find exposure than in a non-disease subject. And bias assignment uh, of exposure, biased assignment to exposed or unexposed group results. So your two by two table is wrong, your odds ratio is wrong. How do you solve this? You should get blinded determination of exposure status. The person who determines exposure should not know about disease status. Case control studies are in, unable to establish a temporal association between exposure and disease. They, can at, they cannot ask the question, is exposure status the cause of disease or the result? What is the solution? None. Use a different kind of study. For example, a case control study divides subjects who survived a heart attack, a myocardial infarction, stop that computer, and subjects who never had an MI into high and low cholesterol groups. The odds ratio is greater than one. How do you interpret this odds ratio? Well, here's the two by two table. There's the odds ratio of 10. That could mean one of two things. It could mean that high cholesterol is associated with a heart attack or that high cholesterol is associated with survival from a heart attack. You're going to tell me, John, that's not possible. If we had more time, I could give you an argument that would show you that high cholesterol might be uh, associated with survival because of something called VEGF, but we don't have time for that. So there are two inferences. High cholesterol is associated with a myocardial infarction. That is correct. High cholesterol is associated with survival after an MI. That is incorrect. Do not tell anyone I said that because if they do, they will take away my stethoscope. All right. Finally, a cohort study. How do you do a cohort study? You ask, does the subject have the disease you're interested in? If the answer is yes, you drop them from your study. If the answer is no, you keep them in the study and you ask, has the subject been exposed to the whatever uh, risk factor you're looking at? Then you let time go, go by, you have them come back, and you determine of these people who are initially uh, disease free, how many have the disease? And you make the wonderful two by two table, and I think about my wife. All right, so you've got diagnosed as having disease during follow-up, yes and no. Exposed at entry, yes and no. You put people in the appropriate boxes. The essential characteristic of a cohort study is that exposure status and disease status are gathered at, the, say, at different times. Remember, in the case control, they were gathered at the same time. Exposure status is gathered at entry and disease at follow-up. The measure of association in a cohort study is the relative risk. It's the rate of disease in exposed subjects divided by the rate of disease in unexposed subjects. And this happens to be what it comes out when you use A, B, C, and D. If the relative risk is greater than one, you say exposure is associated with disease. If it's less than one, you say exposure is associated with protection from disease. And if it's equal to one, you say it's unassociated with disease. All right. Let me bring the relative risk together with the odds ratio. It turns out that A over A plus B, which is one of the terms of the relative risk, is approximately equal to A over B if A is much less than B. If A is 1 and B is a billion, 1 over a billion plus 1 is approximately equal to 1 over a billion. So this approximates that. And similarly, the denominator of the relative risk is approximately C over D if C is much less than D. And thus, this, which is the relative risk, is approximately equal to the odds ratio, which is another reason why odds ratios are useful, because they approximate the relative risk. All right. So re what are the problems with the cohort study? Is recall bias a problem? It's not a problem, because exposure status is determined in non-disease subjects. Thus, recall of exposure is not affected by disease status. 
How about assignment bias? Knowledge of disease status may affect search for exposure. If a subject is known to have disease, the researcher may probe more deeply to find exposure than in a non-disease subject. And you can get biased assignment to expose an unexposed group. Solution, you should have blinded determination of disease status. One of the nice things about cohort studies is that temporal associations can be determined by cohort studies because exposure is determined before disease status. Cohort studies do have a major problem, and that is lost to follow-up. If some subjects do not return and are not included in your two-by-two two table, bias will result if the relationship between disease and exposure is different than subjects lost to follow-up than those who remain in the study. There are ways to get around this. Good follow-up is the best. Try to lose as few people as possible. There's some others. Let me just go through this. Compare baseline characteristics and subjects lost the follow-up to those who remain in the study. And if there is no difference in baseline characteristics, you hope that there's no difference uh, that led to differential dropout. All right, this is very close to the end. Advantages of cross-sectional and case control designs. Cross-sectional studies or case control studies can be performed quickly, relatively inexpensively. They, however, suffer from recall and assignment bias and they cannot establish a temporal association. Longitudinal studies take years to perform and hence are expensive. They are sensitive to change in measurement. They are subject to bias due to assignment problems and bias due to loss of follow-up. However, longitudinal studies do not select, suffer from selective mortality or cohort effects and they can establish a temporal association. One last uh, point. This is a graph of age. And this is blood pressure. This is from the NHANE studies in the United States. Well, I don't have it. You will see that there are a lot of old people who have blood pressures that are the same as young people. And there are some young people who have blood pressures that are the same as old people. This is very interesting. Why are there young who look like old? Why are there old who look like young? If we look at data like these, it can help us determine what to do to establish uh, ways to increase lifespan. So regardless of design, summary data from cross-sectional time series, case control, and cohort may mask important between individual differences, which is I tried to show you here. There are individual differences that this line hides. All right. Epistemology is the branch of philosophy dealing with the origin, nature, and limits of knowledge. And it's also that which makes someone speak too quickly when they're presenting. Finally, this talk is uh, dedicated to the memory of my mentor, the late Dr. Ruben Andrus, a great man of science, whose mother, by the way, was one of the world's greatest Yiddish ling uh, linguists. Thank you. Invite me back sometime. All right. One. Go ahead, up in the top. Yes, comorbidities are always a problem, and there are ways to deal with them, but nothing is perfect. All right, we're going to, okay, quick. For explaining all the problems with studies, You come to me, and I'll show you. <laughs> no, that was my question. I wanted to know, so what works? You all have now taken Epidemiology 101. Congratulations. Wait, wait. I, I, wanna, I, I just want to remark. Right. I, I mean, right. Of have all to be observed. But you know, as a statistic, they are Yes. And we can do it right. But I just want to link it one more thing, which we have all this buzzword, personalized medicine, precise medicine. Uh, could we really do it? No. We are trying to do by our best. And like in every group profession, we have to analyze it right. We have to do the right research. We have to publish.
published at the right time, then it's really right and, and predictive enough. All right. There are more ways to do it wrong than to do it right. <laughs>